Good morning, dear Sangha. Today is Sunday, June the 7th, in the year 2009, and we are in the Assembly of Stars Meditation Hall, Lower Hamlet, during our 21-day retreat. Yesterday we began with uh, right view. And we have heard that right view is the absence of all views. As soon as, uh, as far as you are still, are still caught in one view, you don't have right view. And uh, it is possible for us to to review all kind of views and to transcend all of them. And uh, the noble path consists of uh, right view. And then right uh, thinking. Right thinking has uh, has the connotation of right uh, intention in it. When you think, you express also your, somehow your intention. And then we have uh, right speech, right action. Right action means right uh, physical action, bodily action. Because uh, thinking is a kind of action already. Speaking is also a kind of action. Bring outcome. So, right action here means right physical bodily action. The thinking, the speaking, and the acting is what we uh, perform every day, every moment of our daily life. And our life, uh, the value of our life depends on the value of our thinking, of our uh, speech, and our, our, uh, our action. And uh, in Buddhism, this, uh, this is called a triple action. Triple action. Because thinking is the first kind of action. Because thinking can affect the world. If you think wrongly, the world will be destroyed. The world will suffer, and you will suffer. So that is why you have to practice right thinking. And when you produce a thought in the line of right thinking, a thought that has no discrimination, a thought that goes along with non-discrimination, that goes along with interbeing, understanding, forgiveness, compassion. That thought will have an effect right away on yourself, on your health, and on your mind, and on the world. And this is true. Produce right thinking can heal yourself your body, and your mind. And if you think in the wrong way, they destroy your body, they destroy your mind. So it's a very important to learn how to produce a thought of compassion, a thought of uh, forgiveness, a thought of understanding, 
a thought of discrimination. And that is right thinking. Right thinking can heal you and heal the world. And good practitioners are capable of producing right thoughts at every moment. And because we have right view, that is why it's so easy, it's so natural that our thinking will be right. And right view does not have discrimination. Right view is uh, the insight of uh, non-duality, interbeing, non-discrimination. And that is why uh, thinking can change the world. Have to learn the art of uh, right thinking. Speaking also can change the world. If uh, we are capable of saying something, of writing something, in the line of compassion, understanding, non-discrimination, all embracing, we feel wonderful in our body and our mind. And that kind of uh, right speech will have a healing effect. After you have been able to say something kind, forgiving, compassionate. You feel much better. When you write such a letter full of compassion and forgiveness, you are feeling very well within yourself. Although the other person has not read it, you have not posted the letter, you have not sent the email, but you feel liberated, you feel wonderful already. So right speech also can heal, can liberate, and healing yourself, liberate yourself, and help to heal uh, other people in the world. That is the second form of action. And the third form of action is uh, bodily action. If you are able to say, to do something in the line of saving, supporting, protecting, comforting, rescuing, saving, you feel wonderful within yourself. And uh, you get the effect right away. And that is a triple action. It uh, comprises uh, um, the body, involve the body, it involves uh, the mouth, the speech, and it involves uh, your mind, your mind consciousness. And this is, this kind of action, uh, we call it uh, karma. Karma means action. Yep. Karma. When uh, it is action, we call it karma hetu, karma goes. Karma, hetu. Karma goes. And when it is the fruit, we call it karma phala. The fruit of the consequence, the fruit of uh, your action. There's a French uh, philosopher called Jean Paul Sartre. He said that uh, man is the sum of all his actions. L'homme est la somme de ses actes. It's very close to this. And if we understand act, action, as a triple action, the way we think, the way we speak, and the way we do things. When we observe uh, a lamp, a orange tree, we see that um, the orange tree wants to fabricate beautiful leaves, beautiful blossom, and beautiful oranges. If the orange tree is uh, healthy, and then she can produce these kind of things, very beautiful leaves, very beautiful orange blossoms, and 
very delicious uh, oranges. And we humans, what we can offer is our thinking, our speech, and our action. It is possible to offer the best kind of thinking, the best kind of uh, speech, and the best kind of uh, action. Because uh, that is our continuation. When we think, when we speak, when we do things, we produce. That is the outcome of our, uh, our being. That's our product. And they will not be lost. They will continue in the cosmos. The effect of our thinking, the effect of our speech, and the effect of our action will continue. Whether this body is still there or it has disintegrated, our action continues. Karma continues. Karma as uh, energy, karma, cause, karma, effect, continue. When you produce a thought, the thought you have produced bears your signature. It's you who have produced that thought. You, have, you are responsible for that thought. If it is a thought of compassion, forgiveness, non-discrimination, you will continue beautifully because it has your signature in it. You are the author of the action. If you say something in the line of um, forgiveness, compassion, non-discrimination, and what you say has your signature in it, you cannot say that no, I have not said that. You have said that. There's a signature, your signature in it. You cannot deny that. And action, the same. Whatever you have done, bear your signatures. And they have gone to the cosmos. They are always there. So even if this body is no longer there, you continue. So to say that when this body disintegrates, you are no longer there, is a wrong view. So the so-called scientific view that uh, there's nothing left after the disintegration of the body, that's a wrong view. According to Buddhist wisdom, the view of uh, immortality, uh, permanence, is a wrong view. Because uh, According to our observation, everything is impermanent. Is it? Everything is changing. Nothing can be the same forever. So permanence is not the truth. But to say that uh, when we die, there is nothing left is also a wrong view. And that is also a a pair of opposites. So, immortality is a wrong view. Because so far, we have not seen anything like that. Everything you observe is impermanent. Always changing. But annihilation is also a wrong view. Suppose you speak of the death of a cloud. You look up in the sky and you don't see your beloved cloud anymore. And you cry, oh my beloved cloud, you are no longer there. How can I survive without you? And you cry. You are thinking of the cloud as uh, having passing from being into non-being, from existence into non-existence. But in fact, it is impossible for a cloud to die. To die means from something, you suddenly become nothing at all. To die means from someone, you suddenly become no one. But this is not the case of the cloud. A cloud cannot become nothing. It is possible for a cloud to become rain or snow 
a fog, a vapor, water vapor. But it's not possible for a cloud to become nothing. And that is why the view of annihilation is a problem. And if you are a scientist, and if you think that uh, after the disintegration of this body, you are no longer there, you become nothing, you have passed from being to non-being, you are not a very good scientist. Because that is against evidence. There is a French scientist who said that nothing can die. His name is Lavoisier. Rien ne se crée, rien ne se perd. And you know that he is not a Buddhist. Rien ne se crée, rien ne se perd. Nothing is created, is born. Nothing can die. And that is the nature of everything. No birth, no death. Because birth and death, are, again, is a pair of notions. The cloud in the sky is a new manifestation. Before assuming the form of a cloud, the cloud had been water vapor. The cloud had been water in the ocean. The heat of the sun uh, created by the sun, the sun light. So that is, you can call it his, uh, her previous life. In her previous life, the cloud had been the water in the ocean, the heat, and so on. So being a cloud is only a continuation. A cloud has not come from nothing. A cloud always comes from something. So there is no birth. There is only a continuation. And that is why when we celebrate uh, the birthday of someone, instead of uh, singing happy birthday to you, it may be better to sing happy continuation day to you. That's not your beginning. Your birth is not your beginning. That's only your continuation. Because you have been before that. You have been there before your birth, in other forms. Like this piece of paper. Before this piece of paper appear in this form, it, it, it had been something else. It has not come from nothing, because from nothing, you cannot become something. And looking as a meditator, you can look into the sheet of paper and you see the forest, the trees, and the earth, and the, the soil, uh, the rain, the cloud that nourish the trees. So the previous life of the sheet of paper, you can see. Looking into a sheet of paper, you can see the cloud, the earth, the trees, the paper mill, and that is uh, uh, where the sheet of paper comes from. So the sheet of paper has come from nothing. And the manifestation as a sheet of paper is only a new manifestation, not really a birth, because to be born means from nothing, you suddenly become something. From no one, you suddenly become someone. So the nature of this sheet of paper is the nature of no birth and no death. And it is impossible for the sheet of paper to die. When you burn this sheet of paper, and, when, and you observe, you see that the sheet of paper will be transformed into smoke, vapor, and ash, and heat. And that heat is energy. That smoke coming up is water. And uh, uh, the ash going down, the sheet of paper will continue. So to say that uh, 
after the disintegration of the body, there is nothing more. There is nothing left. It is a wrong view called uh, the view of annihilation. <coughs> so right thinking is a kind of, of, uh, of thinking that is based on right view. And right thinking is free from fear, from discrimination, and so on. With uh, the insight of interbeing, the insight of uh, no self, the insight of uh, non duality, the thinking will have the chance to be right thinking, the speaking will have the, the chance to be right speech, and the action will, be, will have the right, the chance to be right action. And uh, every thought, every speech, every act of ours bear our signature, and we will continue we can continue with our karma. And that is why uh, uh, the notion of, uh, the notion of uh, immortality and the notion of annihilation are just notions. And they have to, the view of permanence and the view of annihilation should be transcended in order for us to have the right view. Right view is the absence of views, including the views of permanence and the views of animation. Uh, we have uh, lost uh, someone who is very close to us. We are grieving his or her death. We have to look again. That person still continues somehow. And you can do something in order to help him or her to continue more beautifully. He or she is still alive in us and around us. With the way, new way of looking, you can still recognize him or her around very well. The way we recognize uh, our beloved uh, cloud in the cup of tea. When you drink your cup of tea, with mindfulness and concentration, you can get the insight that the cloud is in your tea, very close. You have never lost him or her. She is still alive, very close. And may, maybe in a more beautiful form, uh, different forms than, uh, than in the past. So that is kind of vision, that is kind of uh, uh, insight that we should have in order to, to overcome grief. Because we think that we have lost him, we have lost her. But that person has not died, has not disappeared. She continues, he continues in her new forms. And he had to practice looking deeply in order to recognize her continuation, his continuation, and support that. And by producing right thought, right uh, speech, and right thinking, we can support him or her. Darling, I know you are there somehow. Very real to me. I'm breathing for you. I'm looking around for you. Uh, I, am, uh, I enjoy uh, life for you. And I know that uh, uh, you are there, still there, uh, very close to me, and you are in me and we can transform our suffering. We can feel much better. We want to have right view. When we come to right mindfulness, Samyak uh, Smriti, Janniyam, We know that uh, together 
with uh, right concentration. Microfulness can help bring right view. When you practice right mindfulness, you bring about good concentration. And with good concentration, you can break through. You can understand reality as it is. You overcome all wrong views, and you get right view, which is uh, insight. And it is that insight that liberates you from fear and despair and anger. Uh, in Buddhism, we speak of liberation, salvation in terms of understanding. It is understanding, right understanding. It is right will that liberate us. And uh, we know that that insight understanding is possible only with the energy of mindfulness and concentration. And that is why practitioners of Buddhist meditation are those who generate the energy of mindfulness in their daily life and practice uh, concentrated on the object of, your, of, of, of their mind. And then by doing so, they get the right view that will help them to transform, to be liberated from their fear, their anger. Suppose you have the fear of dying. And if, uh, if you touch the nature of no birth and no death, you can remove that fear. And that is why your savior is right view, is insight. And that is the outcome of our, your practice of mindfulness and concentration. In the beginning of our retreat, we have defined what mindfulness is. And we said that mindfulness is um, the kind of energy that can help uh, bring our mind back to our body so that we can be established well in the present moment, so that you can get in touch with life and the wonders of life deeply, so that you can live truly our life. Mindfulness allowed us to be aware of what is going on in the present moment, in our body, in our feelings, in our perceptions, in the world. And that is mindfulness. But why there is the word right mindfulness? Right mindfulness is there because there is wrong mindfulness. <laughs> you keep thinking of the things that, sh that can bring you sorrow and fear. You have suffered in the past. And the memories of your suffering in the past continue to be there and you tend to go back to the past. You review, you watch the film of the past. And every time you get in touch with uh, pictures and films of the past, you suffer again. Suppose you were abused as a child at the age of uh, five or 10, and you suffer so much. You felt that uh, you were helpless. You had no means to defend yourself. They abuse you. You are fragile. You are vulnerable. You, you are so afraid you did not know how to protect yourself. And that, sub -kind, that kind of suffering was created, and then you have a memory of it. There is a film, there is a picture stored in your consciousness, in your in your store consciousness. And every time you go home to the past and look at that picture or watch that film, you suffer again. You continue to be abused again, even when you, you have grown up. You have grown to be up to be an adult. You are now capable of defending yourself. You are capable of using telephone. You are capable of calling the police. You know that. You are no longer that uh, child that was um, fragile. 
and um, vulnerable without means to defend yourself. You are no longer that uh, little child. And yet you continue to suffer the suffering of the, li- of the child because uh, you practice wrong mindfulness. You always go back to the memories of the past. You feel more comfortable going home to the past. Why right mindfulness want you to be in the here and the now? Forget the past. Get rid of the past in order to live your life in the present moment. And there must be ways for you to stick to the present moment, for, for you not to slide back into the past and suffer. Suppose someone slapped you on the face 20 years ago, and that was recorded as a picture. And our subconsciousness, our, our store consciousness, store a lot of films and pictures of the past. And pictures are, films are always projected there, and pictures are stored there. And you have the tendency to go back and watch them and continue to suffer. Every time you saw that picture, you are slapped again, and slapped again, <laughs> slapped again. <laughs> but that, that is only the past. You are no longer in the past. You are in the present moment. And that is why right mindfulness is the practice that helps you to be in the present moment. That did happen in the past. But the past is already gone. It's only pictures and memories. And if you keep going to the past and touch that, that is wrong mindfulness. You have to talk about the original fear, original suffering, and the original desire. When we were a little baby embryo. When he was still in the womb of our mother, we felt so comfortable. The weather is perfect. (laughs) And we did not have to do anything. Our mother breathed for us, eat for us, think for us. We don't have to do anything. And we were in a very soft cushion. Water. Water is the best kind of cushion. And that is a period of uh, no worries. It lasts about nine months. That's paradise. But the moment when we have to be born, that's a very difficult moment. The situation changed completely. You touch the hardship. They cut the umbilical cord. Now you have to breathe for yourself. Your ma- mommy cannot breathe for you anymore. And you try your first in-breath. It's so difficult because there was liquid in your lungs. You have to spit out. You have to, 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 to make an effort to expel that liquid from your lung in order to be able to breathe in for the first time. It's very difficult, it's very dangerous, you risk to die. And you, you were able to overcome that. And you breathe your first. And you are filled full of fear. Your concern is how to survive. You are so alone. You are so fragile. You are so vulnerable, nobody can help you. And that is uh, what we call the original fear. We continue to grow grow, grow up as a baby with that kind of fear. I cannot survive by myself. There must be someone who help me. So you lie there waiting for someone to come. And that someone may be your mommy, the nurse, or your big sister, 
and you do everything you can in order to attract that person to come to you. And your belief is that without another person around, you cannot survive. You need a person in order to survive. That person may be mommy or someone else. So you have a desire. You desire the presence of that person because there is a belief that without him, without her, that person, you cannot uh, survive. <coughs> the feeling is very clear. I am fragile. I am vulnerable. I have no means to defend myself. Without you, I cannot survive. That is our original fear and our original desire. Our desire is that there must be someone. And as we grow up, we learn to manipulate in order to attract that person to come. Sometimes we are given something to hold. Sometimes they take it from you. And one of your weapons is to cry. You try to manipulate yourself. You try to manipulate the situation. And sometimes you smile. But that is to please that person in order for her to come. So you learn a diplomatic smile even when you are a little infant. That's a problem of survival. You learn without knowing that you are learning. And that feeling that you are fragile, vulnerable, without means to defend yourself. You always need another person to be with you. It's always there. That kind of fear, that kind of desire, called the original fear, original desire, is always there. The infant is always alive in us, with that the kind of desire and fear. And in our present days, all our desire and fear are linked to that original fear and desire. If we work non-stop, accumulating more money, that's because of fear, original fear, that I cannot survive. We look for someone to love, to support us. Look for a lover, a man or a woman. That is also the continuation of your desire. When you were infant, you look for mommy. Now you look for another person to be your mommy, whether that is a young man or a young woman. So the new desire is only a continuation of the old desire. The new fear is only a continuation of the old fear. And there is a tendency for you to go back to being that child and suffer the suffering of that desire and suffer the suffering of that fear. that those of us who have a depression, those of us who suffer, continue to suffer, even if in the present condition everything looks all right. Because there is a tendency for us to go home to the past. We feel more comfortable with that home, even if that, in that home there is a lot of suffering. That home is deep down in the store consciousness, where the films of the past are always projected. And every night you go home and watch the films and suffer. And the future is only a projection of the past, with fear and desire. Suppose